So then here it is. Paul used this example in regards of the food that's prepared that is in the marketplace. Notice the uh, two things that Paul mentioned. First, I want you to see, for the sake of self-conscience, for our own conscience, look at with me in verse 25. He begins with this word, eat whatever is sold in a marketplace, asking no questions for conscience sake. How many of you like to argue, to debate? <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> You know, uh, there's nothing wrong to have that kind of, you know, mind sometimes. However, listen to this. Sometimes we do that for the sake of our conscience and to make others to have the same conscience like we do. And sometimes that conscience is not really godly conscience. Sometimes it's just a personal conviction, personal choices. You know, I don't like to use a hair gel. Why? Because I'm, my hair is falling apart. But then that's godliness. So if you wear hair gel, then you are evil. No, where in the Bible says that? Do you understand? Yeah, it sounds foolish, but there are people making standards like no, like out of the wazoos for no reasons, no godly reasons whatsoever. Apostle Paul said this, eat whatever it is in the marketplace. Why is it? For your conscience sake, don't ask questions. Look at the next part of verse 26, for the, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. He quoted that Psalms 24, verse 1, reminded us that everything that we have on earth, it's all of God's. Now, Satan can use that. Satan did that, didn't he, in the first place? Remember when he appeared as a serpent. And the Bible, that the serpent that the Lord God made, God made that serpent one of the gorgeous animals. Today, he's one of the most fearful animal you can imagine. Why is it Satan has used? However, that serpent still is the Lord's. That body, that animal, that creature is still the Lord's. That's why God cursed the animal to walk on his belly. God had control over all that. The earth is the Lord's. So Paul said that for your conscience sake, don't ask any questions. Why is it? It's not that Paul says, like, ignore everything or pretend that you don't know about it. No, 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 it's not that. What Paul saying is that, that you don't want to have any questions or doubts in your heart that God is not the one who provides, but then the idol or somebody else does. Let me give you an example, all right? We go to uh, Countdowns or whatever stores, you know, uh, New World, and you buy a product made by PNG. Uh, P &G. Are you familiar with that? Johnson and Johnsons and things like that, you know, a lot of the Protect and Gambles, yes. A lot of those companies and um, it was in, back in the 90s, early 90s, I remember, a lot of Christians boycotting these PNGs. And the reason why, because the one who sponsored that, one of those guys like Michael Jackson, they said like, oh, you know, they have a, the church of the devils and all that kind of stuff, you know. So many Christians, they're avoiding buying all these PNGs, but you discover more and more there are more products that PNG is produced that is everywhere in the supermarkets, everywhere. And so what? Uh, some Christians are like going to the market, they look at the product, they're like, hmm, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they, they need it, but they don't want to be, and then there's this battle in their conscience. Let me ask you this. Does that product make you become evil? And it's, some people say, like, oh, no, no, the money will go to the evil church. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say about money? Whose inscription is it on the money? Caesar. So what did the Lord Jesus Christ say? Render to Caesar, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar's. Did Jesus Christ worship Caesar? No. He says, this is Caesar, give it back to Caesar's. But render to God what belongs to God. What belongs to God? Everything. Your life. So what do you do? Paul says in here, eat whatever there is in the marketplace. Don't ask any questions. Don't doubt. It is all of God because the Lord and the, everything, the earth and everything in it is, is the Lord's. But then he did not stop that in there. I want you to look at Romans chapter 14. Another word that Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Rome. Chapter 14, verse 14. And look at these words that Paul said. He says, I know... And I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus 
that there is nothing unclean of itself. Of itself, there's nothing unclean. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So it's not God telling them like, oh, this is unclean, that's clean. It's they themselves that make it to be that way. Now, God allows us to have personal preferences, don't we? Some of you don't like to eat pork. Some of you doesn't like to eat pork. Some of you like to eat lamb. Some of you don't like to eat lamb. Some of you don't like broccoli. Some of you like broccoli. Does that mean that if you eat broccoli, you'll be closer to God? Or if you don't eat meat, that you'll be holier than others? What did Paul said earlier in that verse, chapter 11, uh, chapter 10, uh, chapter 11, of, oh, excuse me, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians? Food does not bring us closer to God. Food does not make you become holy or unholy. So here it is, Paul says, remember that everything is the Lord's and everything in itself is clean. There's nothing that's unclean that God has made. So then Paul continued, said also to Timothy, look at it with me in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said, now the Spirit expressly said that in the later day that some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceived spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with the hot iron, forbidding to marry. They said, like, you know, if you want to be holy, don't get married. Is that sound familiar, church? You know, and some of them, this is uh, commending to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Some people say, like, don't eat that, don't eat that. That's all the devil, that's the demons. Be careful. Paul already said this two years, thousands, thousands of years ago, and it's still happening today. But look at the last part of it. For every creature of God is what? Is what? Is good. For every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with Say it again. With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. For it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. That's why we Christians, we pray before we eat. Do you ever notice when people pray for food? Now, I don't want to feel guilt, guilty things. Have you ever considered what you said in your prayer when you pray for food? God, thank you for this food. Bless it. Okay, think about it. God, give it. And you think it's not blessed yet. He already blessed the food. That's why God already put it on the table. But instead, we should pray, God, thank you for this food. And all of this is yours and all is fullness. May you be glorified in this food, in my bodies, for your purpose. Wow. That's the prayer on the table for food. And by the way, it's not just food. For anything. For anything. Give thanks to God for what? For everything, all things. Thanksgiving, thanksgiving is the attitude of Christian worship. Thanksgiving. <coughs> Paul wants us to acknowledge, and God wants us also to acknowledge Him in everything by thanksgiving. Before we take everything, before we consume of anything, before we buy anything, give thanks to Him for that. The next one, for the sake of others' conscience. Not just for self-conscience, but for others' conscience. Verse 27 to 28. Verse 27 begins, says, If any of those who do not believe, if unbelievers, invite you to eat dinner with them. All right? It says, and you desire to go. You desire to go. It's like, yeah, I want to go to my friend who's not a Christian. I want to go. Eat whatever is said before you. Just eat it. Ask him a question for conscience' sake. Just like you go into the marketplace, you get invited to buy unbelievers, they have food out there, just eat it. Alright? Have you ever been to a person's home or a Chinese restaurant where they have big fat Buddha on the altar on the corner of their restaurant? Yes. What do you do with that? I don't want to eat there. <laughs> this is the house of demons. But the food is so good. <laughs> the dumpling is so good. What am I going to do? If you have conscience like that, then don't eat. But if someone has no conscience of that and still be able to give thanks in their restaurants, then do it. But if the owner says, excuse me, we don't want you to pray to anybody but Buddha, then by all means, leave. 
Because it's not about the food. The food is the Lord's. We give thanks to Him. When we give thanks to Him, the, the verse, perfect verse says that we sanctify it. When we give thanks for everything that we have or before we take it, before we buy it, we sanctify it. We set it apart. For who? For God. For His glory. Isn't it amazing how thanksgiving can change that, the power of that? So then here's the principle the same in the first one, in verse 27. But look at verse 28. Verse 28 says, if anyone says to you, so you're still eating with the unbelievers, and then there's someone who's unbeliever in that family group says like, this was offered to idols. Hey man, this one, the meat you go about to eat, <laughs> it was offered to my idols. And then Paul says, do not eat of it. Do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for your conscience. But what does that mean for your sake of others? Like I said to you, you know, if the Chinese restaurant owner says like, I do not want you to pray to Jesus, I want you to pray to Buddha, then don't eat, don't partake in that place. Why? For conscience of first of all, for the others, meaning you need to hold up God's holy testimony. For the unbelievers to see that there is a living Christ in you. That's why you do not partake of that. That's what it's about. But then if they don't say things like that, then yeah, by all means, just eat. Because you're still giving thanks to God. So then it says, if it's over to idol, don't eat it for the sake of the one told you and for your conscience sakes. For the earth is the Lord's. You're testifying that, hey, man, listen. Since this has been offered to your idols, and you said that, I can partake of it because you have sealed, you have sanctified this food by your idols. And therefore, I will not partake of this food. And in that way, they'd be like, so why do you do that? It's not that you trying to argue with them. They have already made a statement of their faith. And therefore, it is allowed for you also to make your statement of faith in your belief. Today, many people, they say they're against Christianity. They don't want Christianity to be in the schools. They don't want to have any prayer in the schools. But listen to this. They're allowing religions to be promoted in their schools. The religions of evolutions. The religions of everything about, you know, same-sex marriage and all that kind of stuff. Those are religions, by the way. It's a belief that they're practicing. And they say you cannot pray, you cannot even give thanks in the school, you cannot, you know, have a Bible, anything that way. But yet you can have those kind of textbooks of their Bibles. Now I'm not being, you know, prejudiced, but this is the truth, isn't it? They are opposing the truth of the Word of God. And they choose rather to live in the lies and to make them become the fantasy for their life. In that way, we are to stand up for that, to say... You know, you can worship, study about all of this knowledge, and you don't allow me to do this in this place. So I can't be here. I remember when we sent Abigail and Anna to school next to our house. We met with the principals, you know, the headmaster, and we have a chat with them, uh, with her. You know, it was a lady, uh, very nice headmaster, and uh, and I. We, we introduced ourselves and we said, our, these are our daughters, but here's who we are, and we are Christians. And I know that in your school systems, you have like sex educations and all that kind of stuff, you know. We want our children to be dismissed from that, to be exempt from that, all that, because I believe, we believe, that it is the responsibility of parents to teach their children of that truth. And then the lady say, yeah, 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 that's good. That's, that perfectly is fine. Just remind me with a note, signed it, and yes. Praise the Lord. Find out later on that she was also a Christian. <laughs> but if she said, like, no, we can do that, said, okay, well, there's other schools we can go to. You know, be careful in how we, you know, our con the to, to testify to others about the consciousness of God in our lives. That we're not to compromise. That's what Paul says in verse 29. Conscience, I said, not your own, but that of other. And then he made a statement like this. For what is my liberty judged by others' men's conscience? 
But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food we offered, uh, for the food over which I give thanks? In other words, what Paul's saying is that we have given this liberty of, uh, from Christ to choose, and that choices is our worship, is the expression of what we believe. However, even though we are to consider others, but God, God's conscience should be first above all things. Have you ever been looked down by other people that says like, oh, I thought you're a Christian and you are eating Texas chicken. You know, <laughs> why don't you eat KFC? You know, it's more kind of Christian-y, isn't it? Or something in that way. You know, some people like to judge just, just to, to look for something to condemn. You know, and I tell you this, it's not of the Lord to do that. So what, we should not do anything? We should just stay at home and just, you know, not being able to do anything because everywhere you go there are evil things up there? No. No. We can, you know, Satan can use God's creation for his glory. Why can we use God's creation for his glory? Think about that for a moment. Does an iPhone evil? Does an iPad uh, evil? Is a computer evil? I got people that says like, oh, those are evil things. We should not have them. If that's the case, then don't wear any clothes then. Yeah. Your birthday suit is God's creation. Just wear that. Walk around. See what people think about you. <coughs> Paul says in here, look at Ephesians chapter 5. What Paul says also to the church in Ephesus. Give thanks always for all things to God. The Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, give thanks always for all things. When you're giving thanks for all things that God allow you to have, that means you have sanctified, like Paul said earlier to the to Timothy, God, you have set it apart for God's purpose, for God's glory. Give thanks always for all things. Let me throw you a monkey wrench. If you have something, or if you are about to have something, or if you are about to eat or drink something, that you cannot give thanks to God, then I know for sure that that is not from God. You understand that? Dear God, thank you for this marijuana. I praise you. Can you do that? <laughs> Yeah. Dear God, I'm about to have an affair with my neighbor's wife. Bless us. Really? That is, I mean, if a Christian commit that, what is that called? Not just hypocrisy. That's a sin that is just almost unforgiven, isn't it? If you're truly a Christian, then to do that, it's almost blasphemy of God. The last thing I want you to see what Paul may reveal in verse 31, the right object of worship. Of course, it's very obvious. The right object of our worship is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Everybody agree with that? Yes. The right object of worship is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very easy to say with our lips, but it's so hard to do in our lives. Yeah. Right? Think about it for a moment. Let me just bring this to you. On verse 31, look at what Paul says. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do how many? All to the glory of God. Let me ask you this. Have we give all things to the glory of God? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, wait a minute. Think about it for a moment. Including every little things that we have in lives. Have we really do all for the glory of God? Or is it just for the glory of me? For my pleasure? For the glory means like for the pleasure, for the, you know, the majesty of someone to testify that in that, in everything. In this case, to God. 
As I said, it's easy to say like, yeah, it's about Jesus. I love you, Lord, and all of that. But let's look at our life in reality. Paul said this, not just to make a statement, but really for us to examine our life. Does all things, all things for the glory of God? Or is that just for the glory of me? I like to eat. <laughs> Who likes to eat? Yes. <laughs> Food, is it wrong? Is it evil? No, no. But taking too much food. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we don't want to talk about food. Let's talk about something else. No. <laughs> this is the reality, isn't it? There's nothing wrong but taking food into your body. It's needful. It is needful. And it is, could be used for God's glory. But taking too much of it and to be enslaved by it, and we cannot move no more. Ugh. Is that what the word? Gluttony? Can you use that for the glory of God? Dear God, I am full already. This is for your glory. One more, one more plate, you know? <laughs> do you think God's like, have it your way? Or do you think God will say that? Or God will say, like, stop right there. You're about to be enslaved by a new master called Porcupine. You know, don't. Now, just be telling you this, okay? There are people just made to be big, there are people that are made to be skinny. So just because you're big does not mean you're evil or you're committing gluttony. Do you understand that? I have people that said that to me, says, uh, listen, when you're too big, you know, you're, you're not godly. Whoa, okay. Let's measure that with the sumo guys, all right? <laughs> I'm more godly than them? I don't think so. That's not what it says in the word, by the way. Whatever you do. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Look at this. It says, and whatever you do, do in word or deed. Whatever you do in word or deed, it said, do all in the name, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I want you to underline that in your Bible because it's important. There's two elements. When you, when we do things in the name of Jesus Christ, our next things to do is giving thanks to God. It's almost like an immediate thing. It's something that you don't have to like, oh, oh, by the way, I forgot to give thanks to God. It's not that way. If you truly, truly use that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever you buy or about to eat in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then he says, give thanks to God, the Father, through Him. Giving thanks is the byproduct, is the byproduct mm -hmm. of our worship to God in everything. Mm -hmm. Not just in the church, in everything, with everything. Do this when you go home today. Before you enter the house and just lay down your burden and all that. I want you to look around, just observe what the Lord God has provided for you. From entering to that door, look at around you, just look at it. There are many things you can give thanks to God. If you have never given thanks to God for that, that means that thing is not being sanctified yet for God's glory. If there's something in your house, the moment you enter, it's like, oh, I cannot, I don't think I can really glorify God with this. I don't think I can. Mm, thank God for this. Then a simple answer, put in the rubbish. That's, that's it. You don't have to struggle with it. You don't have to say, like, oh God, what are, you know, there's an evil and then there's this God and the angel going like this. It doesn't have to. As simple as that. Can this thing that I have help me to worship God or not? If it doesn't, then check it away. So that's why Paul closed with this in verse 32 and 33. I want you to look at two things in there. How we can guard our hearts and minds to live a worshipful life to God. How to guard our minds and our lives to worship God. Number one, be a blessing to others. Be a blessing to others. Verse 32 and 33 says, Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit for many. And if you stop right there, you're going to have a very funny life. 
Meaning that you just want to please everybody. You're like, oh, okay, oh, oh, and you're living like in this eggshells. But look at the last part, don't forget it. That they may be saved. That's the purpose. Is that they may know Christ, that they may be able to worship Christ. Be a blessing to others. Not to give offense, be, be a blessing. Be a blessing. And second and the last, be a godly example to others as you follow Christ. Paul close in chapter 11 verse 1, imitate me just as I also imitate, imitate Christ. The word imitate in there means to follow after, to follow after, imitate. Do you know that God wants you to live in this life still after you know the Lord Jesus Christ to be a godly example? That's what it means to be the light of the world, to be a reflection of Christ. And that's not just for, that's not just for you or me, I mean, you know, for certain people, for every Christian. We are to be the light of the world. We are to be a godly example to follow. If you want to know where your life is in Christ, the first person you can look at as a mirror is your children. Is your children. Do you know that your children is a reflection of who you are? Yes. You know, not to be judgmental or anything, but you know, you can see that sometimes of what the couples really like at home. Not in church, because in the church they can put the Christian face, you know. <laughs> and then when they come to church, they're like, oh, you know, come out of the church. Yeah. There are people like that, those are religious people. And the children see that, and children cannot lie sometimes. They just kind of deceive themselves in that way. But you know something? When the parents are close to God, when the parents is really walking with God, have a life of worship for life, that children, your children will see that and they will imitate you. They will imitate you. So either they imitate your evil things or they will imitate your godly things. So, let me ask you this. How's your life? Does your life really a worshipful life? Is it a worship to God? Does, do the choices you make every day, is that bringing people and bringing yourself even closer to God? Do the things you do in life edify, build up people to be more useful and make yourself to be more useful for God's purpose or not? Answer that question right now. Examine yourself in response to this word of God. I've been praying for this message, for that I, first of all, that I will not be a hindrance to what God wants to deliver. And second, I pray, I pray that God will just work in your hearts to make you to be a life of worship to God. If you would bow your heads in the attitude of prayer. Christians, whatever that God has convicted you in your hearts, perhaps there is something, there's a certain lifestyle that you have that have not been a help or been an edifying to worship God. You need to pray for someone. Commit yourself to God. And really ask God for forgiveness. Repent. Turn away. Give it up. Give up those things that you have. Give up those things that you do in your life that do not help you, that do not build your life to worship Him, to worship God. I want you to examine of whatever that you have in your life right now. Is there anything you have that become a hindrance for you to worship God and for others to worship God as well. Think of your family, your children. Is there anything in your life that have caused your children 
not to be able to worship God in their lives. I want you to surrender all of that to the Lord this morning. Secondly, if there are anybody here, I wonder if there's 